He's one of the most recognised voices today. I'm proud to welcome Jeff Steitzer to the show to talk all about his role from the biggest franchises to date, Halo. Hello, Jeff. How are you doing? I'm good. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> You're most welcome. So how's COVID, uh, the situation with COVID doing uh, wherever you are in the world? Well, um, it's hard to know, you know, because one day it'll seem like things are getting better and then the next day it'll seem like it's all you know, going out of control again. Um, it's odd. I am uh, an older individual, so, and I'm an actor, so the idea of not working uh, is not that unusual to me, and when I'm not working, I tend to stay, you know, reasonably close to home, so in some ways, the last year and a half, almost two years, I've kind of been doing what I would normally do anyway, mm -hmm. and because I am 70 years old. I just turned 70 uh, last Sunday. Um, I, uh, uh, well, actually the 28th week of this Sunday. Um, yeah. I uh, have social security. I've got pensions. So unlike so many of my younger friends and colleagues, I didn't have to worry about the fact that I wasn't working. You know, I mean, I was able to get by without too much trouble, but I know it's been really, really bad for so many of my actor friends who don't have that cushion to fall back on. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. Gotcha. It's been hard, but, you know, we're all hoping, of course, that things are going to get better um, somewhat. It's so, it's kind of scary because of all this Omicron things that have been going on as well, this new variant, and, like, we don't know if we're going to go back into another lockdown for Christmas or anything like that. It's quite... It's quite scary to know that we might be in the lockdown and might not be able to see family this Christmas, which is oh, scary. Oh, God, I hope not. I hope not. I know, right? I'm, I'm, I'm hoping. Fingers crossed. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, it would be nice to get a little good, little good news after the past two years. Uh, <laughs> it's been, well, for us, it's been a little longer because of our political situation here in the uh, united states so you know we're uh, they're just it'd be nice for some good news frankly yeah i agree i agree um, yeah I, I mean i'm i'm used to not going out anyway because of my anxiety and stuff so i'm always stuck in the house and nothing's just diff like that different for me but it's starting to feel different if you know what i mean <laughs> yes absolutely so uh, we'll just begin with some questions here. So how did the role of the announcer on Halo come about? Was it through a mutual friend or did you see advertised? So how did that work? Well, actually, neither of those things. I have an agent here in um, Seattle, where I'm based most of the time, um, who was an actress herself in Los Angeles. And her uh, mother was the actress Dorothy McGuire, who was the mom in Swiss Family Robinson. She was, she was a Hollywood star. Uh, who sort of got her start through Henry Fonda. So I get a call one day saying there's an audition for a new game called Halo. And mm -hmm. they want you to go to Microsoft, to their campus, and do an audition. And I said, sure, you know, thinking nothing of it. Mm -hmm. And I drove across uh, the water. There's a big lake that uh, uh, is uh, between S Seattle, the city, and then the suburb of Bellevue, where Microsoft was. So I drove over there. I parked my car, went inside, passed through security, all those things you have to do. Went into a studio um, and with just like a sound designer. And I think maybe Marty O'Donnell might have been there. I can't recall. It's been so long ago. And I auditioned for a number of things, including Master Chief and I think an alien. I have a vague memory of doing, you know, some weird alien sounding creature. And then we were all asked to make noises like we'd been, we were being, we were dying, you know, mm -hmm. like we were blowing up or had been, I don't know what it was, but I was like, okay, sure. Why not? So I was <laughs> screaming and shrieking and stuff. And eventually uh, we finished and I went home and then I got a call. It might've been that same day or the next day from my agent saying, congratulations, they want to book you to play Master Chief. Right. And I thought, oh, okay, great. Well, time passes. All my friends um, are going in to record their stuff. My friend Jen Taylor, who is Cortana, a very good friend of mine, um, David Scully, Ken Boynt, and all the folks who were in the very first iteration of the game. And I haven't heard a thing. So now I'm getting nervous 
So I said to my agent, um, would you mind checking and seeing what's going on? She said, sure. Called me back a little bit later and said, well, I'm afraid I got some bad news. Um, it turns out that Marty got cold feet about giving you such a large role in this very new important project. Uh, so he's decided to go with somebody he'd worked with in Chicago, which is where Bungie was originally based and where Marty was from. Some guy named Steve Downs, uh, who of course is the person who has been Master Chief for the past 20 years. And it turned out to be, I think, a pretty yeah. spectacularly good choice. But I was told it's like, but they still want you to do something for the game. They want you to be the announcer. And I thought, announcer? I said, I said, I don't sound like much fun. But then my friend Jay Windland, who was the sound designer that I worked with a lot, said, they're going to hear you probably more than anybody have other voice in the game. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I thought, oh, well, okay. 20 years later, here we are, you know. <laughs> so it all worked out well, but that's how I, I got that job. It was, they were, you know, they sent out um, asking for submissions. Microsoft did to all the agents in town. I just literally stumbled into it. How does it feel like knowing like how popular the game is now and how recognizable your voice, your voice actually is? Well, for the longest time, I didn't really have much of a sense of that um, because you've got to remember the way that my part of this worked was every four or five years, whatever it's been, I would get a call one day from my agent saying, oh, the folks from Halo got in touch. They want you to go in and record for the game. And I'd go, great. You know, that was always fun. So I would go in and it might be for two, maybe three sessions of recording. That would be it. And then eventually the game would come out and, you know, I'd hear certain things like it's selling really well, people seem to like it, all of which was great. But I wasn't really in contact that closely, that often with fans. Every once in a while, mm -hmm. I would find myself in a situation where somebody would recognize my voice or, you know, they would know when I said like in a bio that I was the voice of Halo, they, you know, sort of get excited about that. And I go, huh, oh, that's interesting. <laughs> well, I now I'm doing Cameo. And of course, uh, everybody who's contacted me um, essentially is a fan of the game and, a, and, and generously a very, you know, very kind fans of the vocal work that I've done for the game. And it's kind of extraordinary because I have heard so many times from so many people that I was the voice of their childhood, that they've, you know, been listening to me since they were some as young as like six years old. Um, yeah. They've been fans for 20 years. That kind of thing sort of blows my mind. And, um, I think it's been pretty clear to me for a while now that, you know, when all is said and done, should when I pass, there's any note of it, invariably, it'll be, you know, the voice of Halo dies. I mean, that's all it's going to be. Um, none of the plays I've directed or acted in, the Broadway credits, the movies, the film, any of that stuff, it'll all be completely forgotten. Uh, yeah. And it, they'll talk about Halo, which is fine. I won't care. I'll be gone. So, <laughs> but yeah. So I have a, a question about Cameo, actually. So I'm going to move that straight up because we're on, we're on the conversation of ca Cameo. Uh, people can order Cameos from you. What can they expect when they order? So have you got anything? Like, well, you know? there are a number of different things you can ask for. I mean, uh, some people uh, uh, request that I do a birthday greeting of some sort. Or right now, there's an awful lot of uh, uh, requests for Christmas greetings. Sometimes people just want a pep talk. Um, other people have Twitch streams or YouTube channels, or I've actually had a couple of people ask for some recordings of things uh, uh, that they can use in music they're making. Um, so it's pretty wide open. Uh, the only thing, you know, that I'm ever sort of cautious about is not doing anything that I feel would be really objectionable. You know, I don't do political stuff. I don't do things that I think would be construed as being obscene. Um, 
the sort of standard that I, I try to hold to is if it's something that has appeared in the game or is not unlike things that have appeared in the game, then I'm happy to voice that for these folks. And I also just will occasionally tell a story or two. You know, I've told the story about the audition that I had for Halo or other things that might have happened. Um, and I'm happy to talk about it to yeah. anybody who's interested. Yeah, that, that, that's really cool. I, um, I love Cameo. Like, <laughs> um, I, it's kind of extraordinary, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I got Tim Dabo to do some voice lines for a friend's birthday once. Wow. Um, the 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 look on her face was was extraordinary. <laughs> yeah, Few people have recorded their friends watching the videos, and it's yeah. it's it's kind of amazing and very gratifying. I have to say, <laughs> it is. It is. <laughs> so, do you have any uh, behind the scenes exclusives to share from the to- your time recording past Halos? Because obviously, um, NDAs with Halo Infinite and things. But yeah. Sure. Well, I mean, there are a couple of things. Um, that I always love to talk about. Uh, 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 some are, you know, those lines that got away, um, which is interesting because I'm not sure that a lot of people, it's it's so interesting, you know, you, I think a lot of people assume that, you know, we all hang out together and that simply isn't true. You know, as I say, I know Jen, I've known her for years and years and years. I'm a director in the theater. I've directed her several times and she's a spectacular actress and a great collaborator. I only just met Steve in 2020. That's the first time I met him. I tried to meet him when I was visiting friends in Chicago, where at the time he was living. He's now down in, I think, Florida. Um, But for whatever reason, it was, you know, it just didn't work out. Um, And so it was the first time we'd met. And then I've got tons of friends locally who've been in the game. Um, but we don't ever see each other in the studio because of the kind of work I do. I go in and I do all of my work on my own, generally with an engineer and the writer or the producer or both. That's about it. And I'm sitting, I'm standing in a booth that's the size of one of the old phone booths, about the size of uh, what a real uh, English phone booth would look like. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, there's a, a, a music stand, and a microphone, and a window that allows me to see um, the folks who are recording. These days, instead of papers, I have a, a screen that has all the text on it, and I just roll down. I do three takes of every line. I go down through a sequence or down to the end of the page when we had pages. Um, if there are things they want done a second time, I do them a second time. I give them three more takes. That's how it goes, and we tend to get through things pretty quickly. But sometimes the lines that I found most amusing never made it into the game. And one of those was around the time that the uh, former vice president, Dick Cheney, had gone hunting Mm -hmm. and had shot one of his friends in the face. Um, Some writer working on Halo thought, well, gee, you know, I'm, there, there must be occasions when people accidentally shoot their own team members. And yeah. when they do, wouldn't it be fun if they heard my voice saying, Cheney mania? So we recorded that. And the idea was it was only going to pop up like every, I don't know, 100 times or something. It, it, you, you didn't hear it every time, I guess. Yeah. Um, and I think that was their way of trying to get under the wire and and evade the higher ups at Microsoft who might not um, think that was as funny as we did. Didn't work. Uh, all I knew is I, I found out later. It's like, yeah, they wouldn't let us do it. It never made it into the game. Um, somewhere, I think it was, I think it might have been our take might have ended up getting released by somebody uh, uh, at Bungie or I think it was Bungie when we were doing it. I can't remember. They should add it as an Easter egg. <laughs> in yeah, the- that is definitely an Easter egg. And uh, other than that, I mean, every once in a while, uh, uh, I always loved going into uh, work on the games, especially when um, Bungie was uh, originally involved with it, mostly because you would go to their headquarters and, mm-hmm. you know, it was rows and rows and rows of people at computers working on the visuals for the games and you know whenever i'd come in they'd introduce me around and 
we chat and they'd show me what they were working on, which I loved. And then we'd go and record. Now I tend to go to one of the studios here in town or across the water in a place called Kirkland and I'll record there. So, you know, I'm, I'm, it's, it's, there isn't quite the same connection to um, the folks who are actually working on the game. And I miss that. And I'm sorry, it no longer happens. But one time I was in the studio, I'd gone in to record and um, somebody said, uh, we're, I, we may be getting a, a guest in today who might want to watch you record. Do you mind? And it was like, no, I don't, I don't care. So I was in my little phone booth, you know, with my music stand. And I remember I, you know, glanced in, I was talking to the folks in on the other side of the wall who were in the recording area. And they said something like, well, all right, let's do the next sequence. I looked down at the paper. I finished the um, text. I looked up and now instead of two people, there must have been 20 people squeezed into that little room <laughs> on the other side of the window. And I quickly realized that directly in front of me was the actor Hayden Christensen, who had just finished doing the first of his Star Wars prequels. Yeah. As a result, the folks at, I think it was Bungie, decided they wanted to see if that they, they could convince him to do something in the next game, dual voice. So he had flown up. I can't remember if they flew him up or if he'd flown himself up with a friend. They'd given him all sorts of little action figures and all the sort of swag that you could get uh, from the folks when you were doing anything with Halo. And uh, he watched a little what we were doing. We chatted for a little bit. I got back to work. I glanced down, did some lines. I looked back up. He was gone. Everybody was gone. It was back to the same two people who had been working on it. But that was the only time I saw any of the celebrities that they were courting for the game. Later, I would read about people who were voicing things in the games like Keith David, you know, who was an actor I'd, whose career I'd followed uh, uh, yeah. uh, in early days, or Peter Dinklage. It's like, really? You know, but I didn't see them. That's just not the way it works. No, I see. You didn't meet any of them or anything like that. Really. Not really, just the yeah. locals. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, are you looking for a Tyler? I mean, this question's like very, you know, basic. <laughs> um, are you looking forward to Halo Infinite or not? I mean, you, oh, yeah. you oh. will be, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's interesting because evidently it's out for a lot of people. People have been playing it. Yeah. Um, and I've been hearing really good things from people who feel as if it, I guess it feels like the old Halo. Mm -hmm. um, and they're very positive about that, which is great. Um, I don't know any of the details uh, about what happens. I, I did ask Jen, we were having coffee. I said, so now what exactly is going on in this game? And she said, I can't tell you. And I said, no, seriously, what, what's going on? No, I can't tell you. I said, Jen, it's, it's me your friend, your director. No, I'm sorry. No, nope, can't tell you. It's like, <laughs> oh, okay. Um, so I look forward to, you know, getting a glimpse into the game myself in time. But like everybody else, I'm just waiting for it to become generally available. And yeah. then we'll see, you know. So they were that strict with the uh, campaign and things with the NDAs and all that. Oh, kind of yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Well, and, and, you know, God bless Jen. She's, she's very good about that. Now I'm sure you must be aware that um, they are doing a TV version of Halo. You know that, yes. right? Yes. I know. Yeah. And uh, Jen is involved with that. Um, she's the only one of us who is. Um, and she in fact spent several months. Jesus. When was it? Was it this past winter maybe in Romania filming? with uh, Pablo Schreiber, who I think is playing Master Chief in the series. Mm -hmm. um, and again, you know, there was only so much she could even tell me while she was there sitting in a hotel room, uh, waiting to be called to set um, about what was going on. She couldn't really talk much about it. So we talked about lots of other things, which was great. But <laughs> yeah, they're, they're pretty... You know, they, they want it to be a surprise. And it, I, I can't blame them 
like everybody else, I mean, I always go a little bit crazy when a new Marvel film comes out. I want to know what's going to happen. You know, I, I, I want the spoilers and I don't want the spoilers. And I'm kind of glad that, you know, the people can't talk about it because obviously it's a lot more fun when you're watching something like that. And there's a huge story surprise that you weren't prepared for, you know, when yeah. Kang showed up or, you know, the actor who would be playing Kang and Loki, it was like, oh, no, th they're not. No. Oh my God. Oh, it was yeah. very exciting. So I'm sure that for a lot of the folks, you know, that work uh, at 343 and Microsoft, they want the folks who play the game to have that same kind of thrill, you know, yeah. not know yeah. what's coming, um, it, which is, of course, great. It's kind of fun. So. Now, was that the same with the original Highlands with Bungie? Did they ever tell you what was going on or was it? A little bit. Yeah. I mean, they did. They did a little bit. Again, you know, one of the things that was so great about going into the Bungie headquarters was that they were showing me the artwork. Uh, the very first one I went in to, to do, the first Halo. Um, uh, at the time, it was just called Halo. I think later it became Combat Evolved. It was not called that when I went in to work on it. And uh, they were showing me all the landscapes and they were showing me people moving through the landscapes. And now you look at that original artwork and it, it, it's not quite as impressive because things have gone so far. But at the time it was like, Jesus, that, oh, wow, okay. That's, that's pretty spectacular. And yes, they explained, you know, that there were these things going on with these soldiers and with aliens and with rings and planets and stuff. So I had a little bit of information. A lot of what I know about the game, I've been able to sort of find out just by, you know, going online and, and uh, hearing what people say about it and watching mm -hmm. folks play it, because uh, that's sort of what I do. Um, yeah. Have you um, played the game yourself or do you want to play the game yourself? I have played the game myself um, and I'm, terrible i am <laughs> terrible i mean i i am i i embarrass myself uh and i'm embarrassed for myself um the first time i played the game i have to explain that when i first was doing the game uh, we you know finished what we were doing and it was time for the game to come out i would get a copy of the game and i'd go oh oh uh thank you uh, are you going to give me a copy of an xbox uh, you know do i get one of those and they were like no it's like uh okay and you know, those, the Xboxes have always been kind of expensive. Uh, and I wasn't a huge gamer. I, we used to have game consoles around the house because I had two kids um, at the time that some of this was happening. You know, they were still playing Super Mario Brothers and Legend of Zelda and a lot of those kinds of things. GoldenEye, the James Bond thing. But, you know, we never had an Xbox. Uh so I happened to be doing a show in Utah at the Shakespeare Festival as an actor. And one of the interns said, you know, would you like to come over for um, supper? And I said, sure, that'd be great. And it was a trap as it turned out, because after we ate, he casually said, his siblings were there as well. Hey, how would you like to go downstairs to our game room and play some Halo? Uh, it was like, oh, sure, I'll do that. So I went down into the basement and they gave me one of the, the uh, 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 control things and we're on bean bags and one whole wall is the screen. I mean, it was insane what they had set up and we started to play and my, you know, I was able to walk my guy down a hill and into a wall and I couldn't seem to back him up or get him away from the wall. And the other players after a while just got tired and they destroyed me. They just blew me away. Yeah. Um, and blew me away and blew me away. Cause I just, you know, I, I, I didn't know how to make him move. Um, <laughs> it was humiliating. Um, but yeah, so that was the first time I played. I have played it since, and I think I'm a little bit better, but <laughs> you know, when I watch gameplay online, uh, and watch some of these folks, it is staggering, you know, uh, how fast they are. I just, you know, it was not my generation's thing so yeah, that, yeah that's my experience of playing the game next question um is there any particular person that drives you to work in this industry is there anyone who you know inspires you um well 
you know, I was a child of the 1950s and 60s, and so I grew up with cartoons, and I used to love to do cartoon voices. I suspect that that's really where my interest in performing came from, uh, as well as all the movies I saw. I was very jealous of all the young kids that ended up doing Disney films. I was raised in Southern California, and I couldn't figure out why, you know, I wasn't um, uh, in their number, but I wasn't. And uh, over the years, when I did begin to act, I didn't have anything to do with voice acting. I was doing stage work. I would do a little bit of TV or film work. Um, it wasn't until I got to Seattle in 1975, about a year after I got here, maybe 1976, um, I got a call asking if I would go in and do a, a voiceover. And I thought, sure, why not? That sounds great. And it ended up becoming a fairly, you know, consistent and lucrative supplement to the other work I was doing on stage. Um, and I've always loved it because you only have to get it right once. You're not doing it eight times a week for four weeks or six weeks, or in the case of the Broadway shows that I did six months or a year and a half. You know, you only have to do it once. And the money generally is so much better than you're paid to be in a play. So all of that was great uh, because I am fundamentally a pretty lazy person uh, in the sense that I would much rather do what I want to do, which is read, um, see my friends, go to movies, listen to music. You know, that's what I really enjoy doing. And I, I like performing, but um, I'm at a point in my life where it's not quite as great a passion as it once was. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, but I do, I love doing voiceover work. I mean, I find that more often than not, the people working in the profession are incredibly smart, often extremely clever, wonderful company. Um, they tend to be very, for the most part, there have been a few uh, exceptions, but very often they can, they're very concise and let you know exactly what they want. And I've always prided myself on being able to give that to uh, whoever I was working for. And in the case of Halo, I look forward to those calls every four or five, you know, whatever years it is, uh, and getting to meet the folks in the studio again. Um, but in terms of any individual, any single person, anything like that, no. Like so much in my life, it was just somebody said, do you want to? And I said, sure. And I did. And that's that's been the story of my career. Yeah. Yeah. Do you feel like um, Hilo um, overshadows you, the other work you've done? Oh, no question. Absolutely. Um, that's fine. I don't really mind. Um, I enjoy the work I did when I did it. Um, uh, whether it was a play I might have directed, you know, that I felt really good about or a role where I had a fabulous time and really thought I nailed it. Um, other commercial work I might have done, um, whatever it was, yeah, there's no question that that you know Halo is sort of the major thing that people know about me and think about when they think about me, and that's fine. You know, mm -hmm. I, I I am nothing but grateful for the opportunity and the fun that I've had over the years. I'm a yeah. very lucky person in that regard yeah have you ever considered doing like an audio book or um a book I've done audio I've done audio books um now the oddly enough the, the audio book I've never been asked to do is a halo book um I and I when I, I I thought about it and I thought well now why don't they call me to do those you know I mean yeah that, that seems like a no-brainer but I've never been contacted about it um and as I said I'm a little bit too lazy to sort of pursue it myself <laughs> um <laughs> But yeah, I, I have done audiobooks. I've done every kind of voice work, really, that you can imagine. I've done other games. Um, I did a little thing in a Grand Theft Auto when I was living in New York um, some a few years back. I did um, one or two iterations of Aliens versus Predator. Uh, I was in something called No One Lives Forever 1 and 2 different characters. Um, I did just not that long ago, a game called Plants vs. Zombies. If that's anything you've heard of, right. I had, but uh, apparently it's a big game and uh, did that. 
I've done children's games. I've done a gambling thing for Microsoft. I did something about, was it called the Eastern Front? It was about World War II, where I did mm -hmm. quite a bit of narration. Um, I've done other games, things, and they're always fun. You know, I, I, I like doing it. Yeah, of course, of course. Commercials, I've done, you know, tons of commercials over the years. Um, yeah, done a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. Is there any particular voice lines um, from your time as the announcer on Halo that always stick out? Like, for example, you could be like making breakfast, or and then you just randomly like, "Oh, I remember this voice line from Halo," and you have to just and you have to just blurt it out. <laughs> I I don't I no I'll tell you something I don't tend to say the lines much around the house, um, primarily because it actually is uncomfortable to yeah. do that voice um if i had known 20 years ago that i might be doing it quite a bit i i might have been a little bit more thoughtful about choosing a voice that is actually over time a little bit painful to do yeah. because uh but back you know back then it was like i was 20 years younger and i was invincible and you know i never broke down ever in any way not so much now um i will do you know a session or something and spend a good amount of time doing the voice and after that i i need some lozenges because it it yeah. it makes the voice sore um but in terms of the the lines i like you know from the very beginning one of my favorite lines has always been un freaking believable i don't know why i just really enjoy doing that voice yeah um and it's interesting because it's actually a different line than I've done in some of the later games. It might have been when 343 came and I got the copy and it was unfriggin with G's, believable. The original line was with K's. So it was unfriggin as opposed to unfriggin. Yeah. Which I always liked. And uh, I also loved. Uh, it was another line that didn't make it into the game, which was, you suck, which I also made me laugh. I like doing Slayer, you know, yeah. it, it's, yeah. it's fun to do some of those things. But I don't actually go around uh, saying them much in my daily life. If somebody asks to hear something, it's like, oh, yeah, happy to. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the only reason why I ask that is because the funny thing is before I like messaged you to book you and things, I was like, I was in the kitchen, um, and my mom was cooking and I just randomly just blurted out like a, a line from the game. And my mom turns around, she's like, oh, you should interview Jeff Stites. And I was like, yes, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> because I was introduced to Halo through my mom, my mom actually, my mom's really a Halo fan. Yeah, yeah, oh my mom's gosh. a massive Halo fan. And oh to gosh. this, yeah, to this day, she's like, "Oh, I would love to play Halo again." Like, but you kids have, you know, overtaken me. And <laughs> oh no, 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 no! Halo is for all ages. Yes, no, of, course. Mom, of course. Me, Halo is for all ages. Um, that's hysterical. That's great. Yeah, and when I told her uh, I was interviewing you and um, Steve Downs, because I just recently did Steve, Steve Downs, actually, on, it, um, on an interview, she was going crazy, and she was like, oh, my God, I can't believe it. I can't believe it. Mention me. Mention me. <laughs> <laughs> well, please give my best to your mum. Oh, well, definitely, yeah. Uh, it, it, and that's the thing about Halo is that it's being passed along to absolutely. It's that's what's heartwarming about it. And someone did like a um a parody of a Halo trailer that went really popular um not not long ago, like a couple of days ago. I don't know if you've seen it. Wow. Um it was like a fan made Halo commercial and oh that went really viral. Like I mean um I'm an admin on a Halo Facebook group as well. Um, and that was posted and got like so many views. I can't send remember. Send me that. a link. I will definitely, I will definitely send you a link. Definitely. And it, it was so heartwarming. It was like, oh, this is this is what Halo's all about, is the community and how it's 
you know, I really love hearing the stories how like people are like, oh, I used to play Halo with my friend and we used to bring our Xboxes round and <laughs> things. So Absolutely, a lot of folks have been telling me those stories on Cameo, and I'm I'm blown away. I mean, you know, people who were the best of friends when they were in school, and then you know their lives took them in different directions, but they've stayed in touch because they can play multiplayer online. You know, it's like, wow. Um, and yes, there are young people who say I was introduced to this by my dad or, you know, um, or I'm introducing my kids. To, it's, 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 it's amazing, you know? It's mm -hmm. kind of extraordinary to me. So um, because this is a mental health podcast, I normally ask this question and it's in your opinion, how can someone maintain their mental well-being in this industry? I thought about that question uh, ever since I got it, Reese, and it is for a lot of people. It's not easy. Um, I have so many friends. My ex-wife was an actress who eventually she didn't do voice work. I don't think she might have done some, but you know, anybody who's in this in in the arts is a performer um, has to deal with rejection, which a lot of people can't do at all. They have to do with insecurity. You know, the job you just finished could very well be the last job you ever get. I mean, that's not a that's not completely uh, uh, crazy as a notion. And a lot of people can't take it. They just, you know, the combination of those two things is more than they can bear. Um, as well as, you know, just never having the life that, a lot of people normally have. I mean, you know, we are paid generally so poorly um, yeah. in the arts, uh, which is really unfortunate because I happen to think that at our best, what we bring to society is so important and is so healing in many instances. Um, it allows people who are watching our work to be more empathetic often, you know, uh, because we bring them inside people whose experiences and lives are very different from theirs. Um, I think we're, you know, fairly important people, um, but it, we're not compensated in the same way. And a lot of people cannot do it. Um, I know so many actors who become incredibly disgruntled and incredibly bitter um, it seems to be a real problem for old character men. And I was sort of heading down that path when I was in New York. I mm -hmm. shared a dressing room with a wonderful actor um, who had come up from Atlanta to New York with a play that had some success. He was nominated for a Tony. He did not win it, but it led to him getting, you know, more work. And yet it was never never enough you know it's like it didn't lead to starring roles he was still in featured roles and yeah. there were no guarantees that you know when he went into an audition he would automatically book it no nope. i mean you know he like the rest of us was rejected more often than not um one of the things that he had apparently done with his contract for the play we were in we were doing inherit the wind with Christopher Plummer and Brian Dennehy. And he had been led to understand that his name was going to be, you know, up above the title with Plummer and Dennehy, which turned out not to be true for any of the other actors in that very large company. But he thought he would also, you know, at least be underneath. And, you know, he just, it, none of the things he'd been told he was going to get, he got. And he was, you know, really angry about all of that stuff. I was you know, just so tickled to be in a Broadway theater doing a Broadway play that I didn't care what they said about me or where I came in the cast list. Didn't mm -hmm. matter. But, you know, getting a good, you know, getting a notice, which I don't think he did, that was important to him. You know, he didn't get mentioned in the reviews. His role was small. He was the judge. Stuff like that. And I think it warps people in a lot of ways, unless they're smart enough to have a life outside their profession that they give equal time to, you know? Yeah. You've got to keep growing. You've got to keep learning. You've got to 
be able to stop and look around and realize that you are living your one and only life so far as any of us know. You may as well work on that assumption. And I mean, one of my regrets, if I have them, and I guess I do, is that I've spent most of my life rushing from one job to the next and always with an eye on the future and what might or might not be coming up. And it's a little bit like being on a speeding train and only realizing at the end of the line that you've really not paid any attention to all the scenery, you know, that has been, that you've been passing through because you're always kind of focused about moving forward. And, you know, it's like, well, that's to my way of thinking now turned out to be kind of dumb, you know, sometimes the greatest joy in the world is to, you know, go take a walk out in the country or, you know, get on the phone with a really, really good friend and just talk about nothing, you know, but it's hard, I think to do because it's a hard, hard profession. Yeah. Yeah. And even like I've been doing this for a couple of years now and I still feel really like heartfelt when someone I get rejected or I even don't get a message back at all from agent saying sorry the this such and such is busy or um I've been trying to get Jen on for for a while now and I haven't heard anything back from her agent or anything like that and um it's quite hard like you know like oh what, what is it is it me like are they rejecting me because of how I act or is it which like we need to like obviously need to take a step back and think no it's they might be busy the game is about to come out like to literally tomorrow uh because it's already yeah. Tuesday here in the UK so it is tomorrow <laughs> um yeah. so I that's like what I've got to think about it's like she could be really busy she could be doing the interviews well and she she might not even know about this because very often I was told by my agent that, you know, he'd received all sorts of requests for me to do things that he just hadn't even bothered to pass along because he didn't think I could do them, you know, yeah. really or something. And it was like, well, why didn't you tell me? I mean, you know, it might be worth investigating and seeing if it's going to be a problem or, you know, what the hey. Um, we don't have a lot of control over that. And that's the other thing is that actors are treated like idiots more often than not. Sadly, and we don't ever know, you know, you go and you spend, you know, you're asked at the last minute to memorize an amazing amount of text to go in front of a camera, you got to work that out, you got to find someone to do a reading with you to do an audition, and you may never, ever hear another word, it goes out into the void, and that's it. Yeah, and a lot of people, you know, cannot deal with that frustration you know people are so rude i'm sorry to say when it comes to just letting you know it's like thanks so much for coming in it's just not going to work out this time you know or you know a lot just it actors need so little something as simple as saying thank you we're not going to go with you we've decided to go with somebody else but We were really impressed with what you did. Thanks for the work you put into it. You know, how long did that take for me to say it? We Um, don't get that mm -hmm. ever, ever. I've seen- But then, um, you know, get to a point where you shouldn't shouldn't expect it. It's like, okay. Yeah. Not gonna get, you know. Just simple manners doesn't go a long way. It doesn't cost nothing for manners. (laughs) Absolutely. If if I was like a casting director, I'd be like, I'll I'll be saying thank you to everyone, but thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Because like- they should understand how how much it takes to you know memorize some lines or to get up in front of everyone and act like they should understand they should but a lot of people don't you know Mm. especially it seems to me in film and tv where so many people get their their jobs because they are so technically proficient and they've got great visual sensibility that doesn't always mean that they have a clue how to talk to an actor. Sometimes they do. Some of the best directors I've ever worked with were doing film and TV. You know, they'll say one thing and it's like, boom, you know, it just transforms your entire performance. And it was just the thing you needed to hear. Doesn't always happen, but it happens sometimes. 
Um, but yeah, they don't always understand that they're dealing with human beings, you know, and people who are also generally very insecure and desperate for approval. Yeah. So. Yeah. I've been seeing a lot of um, voice actors on Twitter complaining, well, not complaining, but, you know, voicing their opinions about um, big celebrities getting voice acting roles. and Absolutely. Like, and it's, it's so frustrating because it's like the studio's not, thinking of new talent or people who are actually you know used to this profession they're just thinking about free marketing and um because big celebrities like oh everyone's gonna watch this film because such and such is in it and like um I, I love the Kardashians and Kim Kardashian things and she she did a film recently and um she was a voice actress in it and things and I was like well that could have been gone to you know, someone who is new or someone who has a bit more experience. And yeah, that... you're, you're seeing that all over the, you know, every sort of voice work that's out there. Yeah. Uh, certainly like in audiobooks now, more and more people, uh, celebrities are sitting down to do them. They may not do more than a couple, you know, because they're busy making films. Um, yeah. And you think, well, you don't need the money, do you? you know yeah, exactly. but maybe you can never have enough money <laughs> you know i don't know i mean I, it's not a problem i've had to deal with particularly um and there was a wonderful wonderful repertory actor who'd come from england lived in this country for most of his career was based in san diego a member of the company at that theater went to new york did a bunch of things there i think he was nominated for a tony uh, for a performance in a tom stoppard play the invention of love here. His name was Richard Easton. And in talking to his students, he always said, figure out what's the least amount you need to feel comfortable in your living situation and try and mm -hmm. stay there. You may make a lot more money, but just put it away, you know, because as always happens at some point, you won't be working. You know, there may be long stretches where you won't be working and as long as you know, you know, this is what I need to be comfortable and you can achieve that, it's going to make things a lot easier for you. Mm -hmm. I agree. I agree. And that, that's a good uh, motto to go, well, you know, a good thing to go in, like try and save as much money as you possibly can. But here anyway, if uh, it doesn't work out in the acting business, we, we actually have social security benefits to fall on if it gets that bad um right and it, it's not that difficult well i'll say it's not that difficult to get a job it might be um but yeah it's at least we've got something to fall back on and unlike america or other countries where they don't have any sort of benefits or anything you know to fall back on so them it's really struggling yeah. And the other thing that I found, this is this is really, the, you know, two of the largest um, cities where you can go to act are L.A. and New York. And in both instances, the theaters in both those places have really taken advantage of actors. They pay worse than theaters here in Seattle. And the reason they feel they can get away with that is because people go to New York to, you know, be seen and to be talked about. And you can be paid $300 in a little off-Broadway theater, as I once was, but you get your name in the New York Times, which may lead to better paying jobs, you know? Yeah. Nobody cares if you played, you know, King Lear or Blanche Dubois at a theater in the regional theater. Nobody's going to see it, you know, nobody who can do anything more for your career. So people head yeah. to L.A. and they head to New York. And, of course, what they're looking for, those little toe holds and a little, you know, under five line role on some TV series that might lead to something better. It's a crazy, crazy profession. Um, and yeah, I mean, it. I don't know how people do it. New York and LA, I mean, you know, LA, you've got to buy gas and New York is just so damned expensive. Mm -hmm. Every place sort of is, you know, it's just really hard to, to, to do. So it can be incredibly discouraging and you know, to your point about mental mental health, I think that's one of the things that really oppresses people 
Um, very often people just give up and go, fuck it, you know, and go off and do something that really makes them happy, you know, where they're not being judged all the time yeah. and uh, told no all the time. Um, there's so many instances of people I know who've done that. Yeah. Yeah, sometimes I feel like doing that instead. I feel like being like, you know what, sod this. I'm going to do something different. <laughs> yeah. But then but then it gets frustrating because I'm like, no, this is the only thing I want to do. And when people are sitting there like, Reese, I think you should get a different job. You should maybe do work in an office nine till five. And I'm, nope. <laughs> nope. I want to sit here and interview voice actors. I want to sit here and interview people, actors as well. And I want to spread that awareness of mental health, and I have been doing that, and now it's start, starting to get some recognition. I mean, I'm, I'm getting, I'm booking some really big people. Um, it's just um, the, getting getting it out there and advertising and things like that. It's quite difficult. Um, so that that's the only struggle really I'm having at the moment. And I've finally started to get the podcast out in some publications as well recently did a local newspaper called the express and star and then i've done two articles for the metro uh talk talking about resident evil village which um and how mental health has you know brought the community together and how it's uh, how the game's improved but my uh, overall mental health so it's so like when i'm when i'm sitting um in front of family members, especially my auntie, who's very strong about me getting a nine to five job. She's she starts she's starting to get like an interest in it when everyone else in the family is asking me, so how's this, how's the podcast doing? And I've heard you interviewed this big guest and this that's really cool. And my auntie's like, Well, what, what have you been doing? <laughs> and she's like starting to show an interest, which is really good. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, that's the other thing is of course it's often very hard to persuade your parents you know who might have paid for your college as mine did for me you know mm-hmm. this is a, a reasonable play, way to spend your life my dad finally kind of turned around I was well into my career when I got a job uh he was a car dealer he sold Lincoln Mercury's here in the United States and I got a commercial for Lincoln Mercury that yeah. kind of turned his head around he was so because it was something he understood you know yeah. it was one of those weird yeah. plays that i was always doing or you know it was like oh okay he's on a national commercial that yeah. all right oh maybe he'll be okay but it's hard yeah you know i think about it all the time you're and you're quite right i mean you've got to know that this is what you have to do if you don't yeah. have to do it don't yeah you know if I had stopped, uh, I would never have known that I'm sitting here interviewing Jeff Stoitzer or that I was, or I'm interviewing Steve Downs. And yeah. it's, I'm like, no, don't, don't ever give up. You, you, hope, hopefully, you'll get there. Yeah. It just takes some determination. <laughs> Absolutely. So, next question is: What does the day in the life of Jeff Stoitzer look like? Do you have any daily routines, or how does it? Well, I mean, I, they, my day generally starts out the same, which is is that I, uh, when I finally stumble out of bed, and sometimes it's very early, sometimes I oversleep. But mm-hmm. the first thing I always do is I, you know, have a glass of water, and then I make some coffee, and then I have my cereal or eggs or whatever I'm having for breakfast. And while I'm doing all of those things, I will very likely be sitting and maybe catching up on the news. I may be reading because I tend to, I'm one of those stupid people who insists on reading like six books simultaneously, um, which, you know, is is not the smartest way to read books, but it's just what I've, you know, so that's how I do it. So I'll be reading for a little bit and I'll be figuring out what my day is going to be, what errands I have to run. Um, these days, of course, I'm preparing to record the cameo recordings I've got that day. If I have some that day, um, mm-hmm. uh, um, I will very often, uh, go off and see friends and have lunch with them. I mean, in, in many respects, I really should be retired. And at times it feels as if I am because I don't have a job to go to, you know, yeah. it used to be before the pandemic, I was still doing theater. And so, okay, yeah, I'd go in and be at rehearsal at 10 a.m. and 
it would probably go till six or seven or whatever it was. And then once the show was up, you'd show up at five, five thirty, whenever, depending on where you had to go. And you'd hang out. I realized recently that really the only reason I ever wanted to be in theater was because I liked hanging out with theater people. Um, yeah. So that was always what was great. I loved to get to the theater and, you know, laugh and joke and chat about stuff. And then we had to do the play, um, which was fine. And, you know, and then that's sort of the end of the day. Without that, then I do more reading. I do more sort of figuring out what's going to happen in the future. Right now I'm in the process of trying to organize what will very likely be a several month long road trip. Yeah. Uh, um, my lease on the apartment that I rent uh, is going to be up at the end of April. And I'm thinking what I'm going to do is not renew, put everything into a pod, have that stored, yeah. climb in my car and take off. Go back to the Midwest where I was born. And after I'd spent time in San Diego where I was raised, and see all my family who are still there, see all my friends in Minneapolis and Chicago, then keep going east, see my daughter in Buffalo, see my brother in Maine, see actors all along the way, maybe leave my car in Maine, train down to New York, spend a month, maybe two, just looking around and seeing if there's any work to be had, you know, TV or film stuff. Uh, and then eventually turn around and come back, maybe veer down into California and see all my friends there. Yeah, sounds sounds like you've got a really good plan for the future. No, 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 no. I mean, yeah, I mean, that's that, obviously I'm retired, you know, I'm retired, but still working. So yeah, um, yeah. and I feel very lucky, you know, to be able to do that. But I, I now with since the pandemic, it's like I'm not anxious to go back into a theater I'm not sure I'm terribly comfortable quite yet. And uh, uh, honestly, I, the thought of doing eight shows a week just is not that interesting to me. I'm tired of being in a dark theater too much of the time and obsessing about preparing for the performance, doing the performance, thinking about the performance I just gave. You know, I, I just don't have that much time left in my life to be, you know, going down those holes. Just not interested anymore. Yeah, yeah. Oh. So, lastly, um, can you give us some voice lines telling our audience to follow us on all social media at Mentally Obsessed? No, 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 of course I will. All right. Spartans, follow the Mentally Obsessed podcast on all social media at Mentally Obsessed. Brilliant. How was that? That was good. <laughs> <laughs> it was great. It seems so, so natural. It is great. <laughs> well, as I say, it's one of those things, you know, I, I, it's fun, even though it's painful. It's fun to do that voice because you're going up and down and you've got all kinds of attitude. You know, it's, it's, <laughs> yeah. it's, it brings out a bit of the devil in me. So I really enjoy it. <laughs> I'm happy to do it for you. Yeah, you've got some sass. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. So, uh, Halo Infinite is scheduled to hit stores December 8th on Xbox consoles and PC via Steam or own it on Game Pass Day 1. Thank you so much, Jeff, for uh, joining us. My absolute um, pleasure, Reese. Thank you so much for asking. Of course, of course. I'm so glad for Cameo, actually, because I, I was looking at the scouring the internet for hours I was trying to find contact information for you. And then I was like, oh, I could pay a small fee to message him. So on Cameo, so, so Cameo saved the day. <laughs> God bless them. Hey, care. have a very, very happy holiday season as well. All right, man. And a great new year. Here's to a really, really good 2022. I hope so. I hope so. I this, hope this COVID magically dis disappears. Uh, we probably won't be now. At least get better, sure. I'm incredibly proud to be joined with the voice of Bella Dimitrescu, Becca Prewitt. You know, I'm like, that naturally comes out of me, you know, but I don't actually do it in public. <laughs> but sometimes behind closed doors, I'm like, Ugh. it's that, you know, Irish Scottish part of me, you know, that comes out, it gets a little fiery. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> but I control it, you know, with humanity. I just imbibe it. I'm like, oh my gosh. <laughs> don't we all, don't we all. <laughs> right? <laughs>
So the next question is, if you could write or reprise your role in an upcoming DLC or even a spin-off film TV show, learning a bit more about House Dimitrescu, would you want to give your input and would you act in it? Yes and yes. <laughs> um, absolutely. I would love to give input if they, if they wanted it. But I had to say that Capcom are kind of brilliant. I mean, they, um, they crafted both from my all-time favorite sci-fi TV show, Star Trek Voyager, Queer Mirror in Gears 5, Star Wars, and many more. Super excited to introduce Karen and Seymour to the show. Who was your support then when you were a kid? Um, my, my name, my mom. My mom was uh, the out of support. And she knew that you were gay? Yeah, yeah, she knows, yeah. When did you tell her, or did she always know? She, she was like, oh, I've, I've always known. <laughs> good, yeah, good. She was very supportive. I still don't know. I mean, I've never understood why people why people care. It's yeah, just... I know. It's like, you shouldn't really <sighs> need to come out, but, you know, it's society. <laughs> you know, it's called human being. It's called human being. Yeah. Nothing else. Nothing else. Valorant, F in the crew, Matt, talks all about Astra. I was extremely... Positive. And people used to always say, you know, I don't really drink and all that because my energy is quite high. And people were always like, why? How are you happy? And you're not drinking. Da, 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 da. And all yeah. sort of, how do you always have this energy? And it was just this internal joy because I was doing what I felt I was called to do. Yeah. And I think what that did was blind me to sort of the reality that one, not everyone will like you. Two, not everyone will want to like you. There are people who will work really hard not to like you. <laughs> yeah. Three, um, you have to understand that everyone has a different view or experience of life, and that's what informs them and their decisions and their behaviour. My inspiration is Timothy Charlemagne. I love Timothy Charlemagne. I think he's a very, very good actor. <sighs> Yeah, and um, Carrie Fisher as well. Carrie Fisher was amazing. Oh, yeah. Uh, there's yeah. so many I She's could name. <laughs> the list could go. It's hard to pick one. Exactly, it is, yeah. <laughs> so next question is, in your opinion, how can someone maintain their mental well-being in this industry? I ask this question a lot, but everyone's got a different take on this question. So that's why I always mm -hmm. include it, because it's always a different answer. Yeah, and I think it's a difficult thing to get a grasp of. I think that's why we have so many issues in this industry um, around depression, around addiction. And not to say that those aren't issues elsewhere because they obviously are, are things that people, myself included, struggle with. I think in this industry, there's just a highlight on it because there's a highlight on everything. Once you, once you become known enough, kind of everything changes. And that's been a big experience for me with, with Resident Evil is it's no longer just my family and friends watching what I do. This is Steve Downs, the voice of Master Chief, Spartan 117. I need a weapon. And I need you to join me on the Mentally Obsessed podcast at 5 p.m. GMT, the 30th of November, on all the usual podcast platforms. And together, we will finish the fight.